we started these studies of high fat in 2002, and we didn't go into these studies as scientists should do with, with a paradigm thinking, you know, this isn't going to work. We wanted it to work. As a scientist, you go in with a hypothesis of no difference. It's of no consequence to us whether X diet or Y diet works. So if high fat diets had worked, we've done 10 or 15 studies now, we would be prescribing them for athletes. They don't work. So that's why you do the science, you give the message to the coaches and the athletes. But again, the message seems to get mixed somewhere up in the social media. That triathlon show. Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and on today's episode I interview Professor John Hawley. John is one of the leading experts and leading researchers in the world on endurance sports and nutrition, uh, having done plenty of work in fields like the interaction between diet and exercise and uh, the cellular and molecular basis of, of endurance sports adaptations. And today he joins us to give a complete update on what we actually do know, what is fact, what is fad in today's world of endurance sports and nutrition. So let's get into that as soon as we thank our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. And if you've listened to my interview with Andy Blow, who is the founder of Precision Hydration, you know that some people can lose as little as 200 milligrams of sodium per liter of sweat, whereas for some people it can be over 2,000 milligrams per liter. And when you add to that that people's sweat rates can differ by uh, a five or six fold variance, then it's clear to see that you need to put an emphasis on, on what your individual electrolyte and sodium needs are, especially if you're going to be racing in longer races or in hotter climates. So go to precisionhydration.com, take their free online sweat test, which is a simple quiz that you can complete in a few minutes. And I will give you an individualized race hydration strategy to apply in your next goal race. You can use the promo code that triathlon show all one word to get your first box of electrolyte from Precision Hydration for free. And big thanks also to Roka. As discussed last week and announced last week, Roka are running a giveaway for that triathlon show listeners, which gives you the opportunity to win an entry to any Ironman race in the world plus a Maverick X wetsuit as the first prize of that giveaway. So that's a great, great, great prize. But there are other prizes as well. Customized high-performance sunglasses, buoyancy shorts, R1 goggles, and more, taking the total price tally up to above $2,000 in prices. So go and sign up for that free giveaway and uh, enter for your chance to win especially that Maverick X wetsuit, which is ridiculously fast. I, I use it myself, so I can attest to that. And of course, that race entry, which would save you a ton of money compared to actually buying, paying for the entrance fee yourself. The URL is roca.com forward slash TTS, and it's linked to in the episode description and in the show notes, of course. Uh, so check that out. Roca is spelled R-O-K-A. And uh, if you are doing any regular shopping on roca.com, as usual, you can use the promo code TTS, all caps, to get 20% off that order. So without any further ado, let's get into the interview with Professor John Hawley. Welcome to That Triathlon Show, Professor John Hawley. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's late at night here, but uh, probably very early in Europe for you. So uh, good to talk. Not, not too early. It's uh, it's uh, midday here in Portugal. But oh, uh, thank you yeah. for for doing this uh, over there in Australia late yeah. at night. Uh, it's uh, it's a pleasure to have you have you on because you're one of the uh, one of the leading researchers in the field of, of nutrition. So uh, let's have a deep dive into some of the topics that are very interesting for for all endurance athletes. And uh, but I guess first, can you give us a little bit of information about your background and and how you got into this field? Sure. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting one. It wasn't a direct uh, entry into this field. I actually started uh, out doing economics as my first degree, but then realized that I hadn't really got too much passion for that. So switched to exercise physiology, did 
did my undergraduate training in the United Kingdom at Loughborough University when there were some pretty good runners around, Sebastian Coe and various other runners who were uh, very much faster than I was, I might add. Then I went over to Dave Costell's lab in the USA, did my master's there, and eventually ended up doing my PhD and a postdoc training at the University of Cape Town Medical School under Tim Nope. So um, quite a selection of uh, celebrities and, uh, and mentors along the way. And your current role is what exactly? I'm now the director of the Mary McKillop Institute of Health Research here in, uh, in Melbourne, Australia. So we have a, uh, a large group. It's the Exercise and Nutrition Research Group. So as the title denotes, we study exercise and nutrition and their interactions, their effects on training, their effects on health. We do not delve in drugs or anything like that. So uh, and when I say that, I mean pharmacological <laughs> drugs rather than anything else. Um, so every study that we do has basically got either a nutrition or an exercise perspective, or in in most cases, probably both. Yeah, that that interaction is uh, is very interesting, and, and we will get into that for sure. Uh, before we do that, though, can you give us just a very brief overview on carbohydrates, fats, and protein, and their role in if we start with just general health and wellness? And uh, let's keep this very brief because obviously we could go on for hours on on this topic. So, so just a ten thousand foot overview. Okay, well, that's um, that's a very open ended question, as you said. I can probably lecture on each of these topics for many weeks. But uh, well, let's start with fat, because I think that's the one that's probably been most misunderstood. And we'll probably get into this later, as you said, but you know, the the avoidance at the moment of carbohydrate diets and high fat diets, I think has been has been overplayed. And I actually think the role of fat in the athlete's diet has also been overplayed. And again, we can, we can discuss that there is a role for fat in both the athlete's diet. And if you like the uh, unhealthy or inactive person, but uh, it, it's a permissible role, as we shall see later when we discuss the athlete's diet. As far as carbohydrates, look, again, a lot of bad press around carbohydrates at the moment. It's an essential fuel. If you're an endurance athlete, if you're a, an athlete involved in high-intensity sports, just so your listeners know, the higher the intensity of the exercise, the more you will burn carbohydrate-based fuel. So carbohydrate is absolutely essential. Protein, I think, has come back into vogue. And, um, you know, there are many great labs around the world. Luke Van Loon in Maastricht, Stuart Phillips uh, at McMaster University in Canada, who have done a lot of work on the various types of protein for both building muscle and also preventing sarcopenia, which is muscle wasting in the elderly. So I think protein's come back in vogue. And I think, if you ask my opinion on that, I think a lot of people would be preferable to take in a little bit more protein and perhaps drop the fat. But, um, Again, they're topics for for later on, I guess. So that's a, a very generic overview. I guess the bottom line for, for people who are listening in, though, is that if you didn't know already, fat per gram stores twice as much energy. So if you think of carbohydrates and you think of protein, you get about four kilocalories per gram. If you think of fat, you get around nine. So you can either turn that around and say you can eat twice as much carbohydrate and protein as fat, or you have to eat half half as much fat to get the same you know bang for the buck calorie wise so that's fat carbohydrate and protein 101 very very quickly yeah and, and that's interesting like personally when when it comes to staying full as an endurance athlete i think that i've found personally that the volume of food i eat has a very strong correlation with how full i feel afterwards and, and not overeating so that's why eating a lot of things like like vegetables which uh, have a low caloric content for a big volume but plenty of fiber rich carbohydrates like potatoes and beans etc yeah. i also found are staples in my diet because of that fact that you mentioned with with the the, the calories per, per gram compared to fats for example but one more thing yeah. about the fats uh, and carbohydrate for just if we take endurance out of the uh, question here because there's obviously even yeah. more talk about this in the media for general health and wellness is your opinion still the same that that it's overplayed or what what's, does your opinion change in any way look i think we have to be careful with the population we're talking about here for people who are predisposed to type 2 diabetes for example and have what we call insulin resistance then carbohydrate is if you like a, a dangerous fuel for them because of the massive fluctuations in blood glucose that occur and so obviously if you put that sort of an individual on a high carbohydrate diet you, you're doomed to failure and you're actually setting them up for failure in the long run as far as actually becoming a, a type 2 diabetic. But overall, if you're looking at the, you know, and I use the word 
very carefully healthy population because at the moment most of the population aren't that healthy and that's again uh, something which has changed dramatically in the last 50 years then I don't think the general recommendations for for the proportion of fuels that we take in has changed dramatically one thing that has changed dramatically and it's fairly obvious if you go to America for example but not so much Europe is the portion sizes so I don't think the macronutrient composition of diets has changed dramatically over 40 or 50 years, but certainly the quantity of food and therefore the quantity of energy and calories that we're taking in is, you know, two to threefold greater in some cases when you go out in restaurants now to what it was in the 40s and 50s. And, you know, there's good, there's good data on that now that the portion sizes are very, very large. Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense. So moving back into the endurance realm here, and uh, let's first make sure that uh, we can all get the basics right. And before we get into the nitty gritty details and uh, and the icing on the cake, so to say. So what is the, if we call it the 80-20 of nutrition for endurance athletes? Well, look, let's just define what we mean by endurance to start with. And I think, you know, any event which is uh, of a continuous nature lasting more than 30, 30 odd minutes or something like that. Because if you look at those events and look at the energy required to combust them, even if it's a, a soccer game or a stop start game and some of the team sports, again, most of the energy is coming from carbohydrates. So, you know, almost all Olympic events and almost any, any sporting event, unless it's a pure sprint, does depend on carbohydrate and does have some endurance component, even as I said if it's a team sport. As far as the 80-20 rule, again, uh, we'll get into the periodization of nutrition and how training load and volume affects that. But again, for the endurance athlete, the diet should be carbohydrate-based. And one of the questions that you sent to me is, you know, what are the what are the, some of the terms that get misused? And I think the concept of a what a high carbohydrate or a low carbohydrate diet is 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 massively confused in the media. You know, I think people think a high carbohydrate diet is just eating as much starchy food, potatoes, bread, rice, and pasta as you can in a day. That's not true at all. So uh, I think we have to be very very careful with our terminology. So as far as the eighty twenty rule of nutrition, and again. I'm going to tell you here that nutrition is great, but nothing replaces training. There's no question about that. We eat to support our training, you know, not the other way around. So I always, when I'm talking to athletes, say, look, your nutrition is vitally important. You won't be able to train optimally without it. But let's not steer clear of the the main aim. Training is to induce training adaptations. And the physical work that you put in in training is, is, you know, if you like the 80 in the 20s, the nutrition on the top, that would be my way of looking at it. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. And how do you look at things like uh, sports nutrition products in in training, the use of them, and and uh, eating healthy outside of outside of training and racing, and and then using those products? What's your take on that? Look again, there are so many products that that answer could take all day. And um, you know, I'll, I'll confer to my wife here, as some of your listeners may or may not know, is Louise Burke, who's um, much more famous than I am and is the head of sports nutrition at the Australian Institute of Sport. Uh, And the emphasis there for the last, you know, dozen years or so has actually been on foods rather than supplements and the bars and the gels and everything else, because a lot of the products don't have vitamins, minerals, fiber, or other things which are essential in the diet. And I think sometimes we've lost track of, you know, normal food and what athletes should eat. Now, having said that, the caveat there is, you know, if you're traveling, if you're in a remote place, if you're not able to sit down after a training session in the morning and get a normal breakfast, then some of the bars and the gels and the products are very, very, very good. But I don't think we should use them as forming the basis of an athlete's diet. I think, you know, foods are foods. And as such, we should be making those the priority. And if you like the icing on the cake, as you've used the term earlier, is the bars and the gels and the sports drinks and everything else. They do have a place. Don't get me wrong. They definitely have a place. But I don't think they should replace, you know, normal food and and a, a balanced diet for the most part. Sure, but but if you're going out for a four hour ride, is your opinion then that you should be using supplemental energy during during training session, uh, or should it, does that vary, or what's your take on that? Well, again, yeah, I'd have to say, what's the purpose of the training session? I I had a coach who said, it, if I cannot tell you the purpose of the training session then you can you know you can put your bike away or go home and put your running shoes away so my first question to you will be what is the aim of that training session now if you said to me 
It's a Sunday morning, low intensity recovery ride where the, uh, I guess the, the output of the training session is low to moderate and you want to burn a lot of fat. Well, then you probably want to try and abstain from carbohydrate as long as possible. Um, if, on the other hand, you want that ride to be at a race pace, if you're doing Hawaii Ironman or something like this, then obviously you want to supplement. So, again, I'd throw the question back to you or back to the athlete or the coach and say, what is the priority and the goal and what do you want to achieve from the training session? When you've got that in mind, then you can tailor the nutrition to the training session and not the other way around. Okay, I think I think that gives a, a good perspective. So if you're doing some specific interval work, whether it's race pace or, or higher than race pace, then then you might uh, probably want to use carbohydrate. And if it's a lower intensity ride, an endurance ride, then you uh, then you try to work on on fat oxidation and trying to abstain from from those supplements as long as you can. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, possibly because remember, any time that you take in carbohydrate, you know, you take in a drink on the bike or on the run or wherever it is at the swimming pool, immediately you do that, your fat oxidation, the rate at which you burn fat is is massively suppressed. And I guess one other thing for the listeners is, you know, even a pre-training session meal, if it's high in carbohydrate, can blunt what we call the polysis, the breakdown of fat, and can actually impair fat oxidation for several hours. So it's very, very important. You know, you have that cup of coffee before you go out on the ride, which is fine, but if you put sugar in it or take anything with some carbohydrate in it, then expect an insulin response and expect the fat oxidation rates to be lower than they would if, for example, you went out fasted. So again, you, you've got to be pretty clever around these things because just subtle changes in your nutritional status can massively alter the fuel balance and the total fuel bill of any training session. This is actually very interesting because when we look at uh, r- curves that we get as results from uh, metabolic testing, like how your fat and carb oxidation changes based on on power on the bike, for example, they obviously seem fixed. They, there's nothing in the chart to indicate like what your uh, what you ate before or or anything like that. It just looks like every time you go at 200 watts, you're burning X amount of fats and X amount of carbs. But but you're saying that the the difference is quite dramatic when you, for example, pop that gel. So so how big is the difference? Do you know off the top of your head? Can we quantify it and uh, or no, I, I can I can point you to studies. If you look at work from George Brooks's lab, and it was done uh, in the early 2000s, it was worked by Brian Bergman, and uh, he looked at this exact question that if you have pre-exercise meals or fasting, could you shift the curves? And the answer is you can shift them try dramatically. And again, just for the listeners here, the, the point here is two things I want to make. Firstly, the absolute intensity of exercise determines how much fuel you will use, the total fuel bill, the relative intensity, that's how hard it is for you or I, what percentage of your maximal heart rate, what your rating of perception of effort is, what percent of your VO2 max, that determines the fuel mix. So again, 200 watts for a world-class cyclist, you know, they're probably burning almost exclusively fat. 200 watts for the man in the street, they'd be close to max and they'd be burning carbohydrates. So again, you've got to be careful here when you talk about the fuel mix because it's obviously, as you know, both the absolute and the relative exercise intensity, which can change that dramatically. And then on top of that, the nutritional status can shift that curve to the right or the left, depending on if you're talking about carbohydrate or fat. So again, it's uh, it's been oversimplified, I think, in the literature, but those early studies show quite dramatically that you can alter the fuel mix quite substantially by, you know, a pre-event meal. And you can also, as I said earlier, suppress fat oxidation for many, many hours after a high carbohydrate meal. I'll definitely try to to find the study and, and link to it in the show notes. Do you have any rough ballpark estimate for or, or an example of how big that shift can be if somebody's burning, for example, x grams of fat per minute how is that shifted in terms of percentages or whatever when you when you have right. a gel or you have well, a pre, pre-workout meal let me give you an example and it's not quite uh the example i you're probably looking for but I'll, it's data which i know very well and this is data which was published by um louise burke and her colleagues in journal of physiology uh a couple of years ago and this was when athletes were keto adapted in other words, they're on a high-fat diet. Now, they've been habitually on a high-fat diet, so it's a little bit different to your acute situation, but I can give you some exact figures. When 
the subjects are on a normal diet, their normal training diet, which is predominantly high in carbohydrate, at a fixed submaximal work rate. It doesn't matter what it is, but it was their 50 kilometer race pace. They burnt about 0.5 to 0.6 grams of fat per minute. Now, when you shifted them to a high fat diet and took away the carbohydrate, that number doubled. And in some cases, an in individual athletes was even more. So you're talking here of a doubling of the rate of fat oxidation in a chronic state. Now, as far as the acute state, it would be less than that. But if you're doing a four hour ride and you change fat oxidation from, you know, 0.3 grams to, to 0.6 grams over the course of a two hour ride, that's quite a substantial increase. So the data's out there. Uh, it's probably, you've asked me for a percent, probably 20 to 30 percent in the acute case. But in the case of someone who's had a high fat diet habitually for several weeks, you know, you can double the rates of fat oxidation. Okay, excellent. And, and going back to that topic of the 80-20 or nailing the basics of, of nutrition, just a couple of things, your thoughts on things like uh, frequency of meals and uh, I guess nutrient timing in terms of the, the day-to-day, like when should you have carbs, protein in relation to your hard, easy workouts, etc.? Well, look, anytime you're doing a hard endurance workout, I think, you know, the message is still reasonably clear from the the 80s and 90s is that, you know, carbohydrate before, during and post is is a good thing. There's no question about that. As far as protein goes, there's ample evidence now that, you know, good quality protein sources in the what we call the golden window, the the one to three hours post exercise adds to the muscle stimulated increase in protein synthesis. And what I mean by that is that contraction alone of the resistance type would increase protein synthesis. But when you add protein ingestion onto that, it's almost a doubling of the the rates of protein synthesis. And again, I know you asked me about endurance athletes, but I think protein for endurance athletes has been perhaps, you know, underestimated. And because of more muscle damage, particularly in sports like running, I think that people who are endurance athletes and do do high mileage probably need to pay, you know, spend a little bit more of their time and pay a little bit more attention to their protein intake. Generally, it's okay, but you know, we're looking at, uh, at, at, at up in the RDAs. In other words, 0.8 of a gram probably doesn't cut it for endurance athletes. You probably need in the order of you know, 1.2 grams of high quality protein for each kilogram of body mass that you weigh. And I think, you know, if you look at the position statements now from the IAAF and the IOC, I think you'll see that that, that we've come around massively in the last 10 or 20 years to realize that endurance athletes do need more protein than was perhaps originally thought. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's a, that's a good, uh, good good advice for, for the listeners, definitely. And and it's something that I'm, just as a personal example, working on, and, and I'm not always the best at that. I'm probably regularly around 1.5 grams per day, I would say, definitely on a day-to-day, but that doesn't seem to be as optimal as being at 2 grams or higher per day at, at a fairly high volume of around 20 hours of training per week. So when I'm really well, when I'm really diligent, I notice a, a clear difference in in my recovery and and also potentially even performance in like how much I improve in a block of training. Well, that's a firstly that's a good training load, twenty hours a week, and you know you have to be paying attention to your diet if you're going to get through twenty hours of of training a week. So for your listeners now, my normal threshold is if you're doing more than fifteen hours a week, you're a you're a pretty serious athlete. You're probably doing it something more than health, and therefore. Your nutrition actually comes more important the more training you do. One thing I want to touch on, which you did ask me and I didn't really answer, is the timing of protein. And I think we were the first to do the study. Jose Areta did this in my laboratory a few years ago, and it was published in in Journal of Physiology. And I'm quite happy to send you all these papers so your, your listeners can go to the links. But we looked at protein distribution throughout a day. And the, the I guess the traditional way, not so much in Europe, because when I come to Europe, I generally do have more protein uh, particular from the Scandinavian countries, you know, I have fish or salmon for breakfast, which is pretty unusual here in Australia. But what we looked at there is if the distribution of protein throughout an exercise bout and then for 12 hours post exercise, this was an 18 hour study, we kept subjects in the lab almost all day. And obviously, the researchers who did the study, and we showed quite clearly that by spreading the protein in small 20 to 25 gram feedings throughout the day, was much more effective than giving exactly the same amount of protein 
but either in one big dollop in the morning and one big dollop at night or just trickling very, very small amounts in. So 10 grams, you know, every 30 or 40 minutes. So I guess the moral of the story there is we took the recommendations for strength trained athletes, which are in the order of 20 to 25 grams post exercise. And we just kept doing that throughout the day. And again, if you looked at the the area under the 12 hour protein accretion curve, in other words, how much protein synthesis took place, the regular feedings of 20 gram were much more beneficial. So if you're taking in your 1.5 grams, you get a big tick. But if you're taking that all in, in, you know, one meal late at night with a, you know, massive steak or whatever it happens to be, I'll take half that tick away because the better way to distribute that is evenly throughout the day. Yeah, I, I'm very good at that, actually. I, I think that one of my, my staples is, or two staples that I have are uh, Greek yogurt and, and eggs and, and also tuna. Th- those are free staples uh, that uh, I find it easy to work into any meal, whether it's breakfast, an uh, afternoon snack or, or a regular meal. Uh, so, but- yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the foods that you've just mentioned here, we have a, a range of yogurts, which I won't mention, but, you know, we know they're 15 grams. You know, eggs generally are between five and seven grams, depending on the size of the egg. You know how much is in a can of tuna, you know, maybe 20 grams, something like this. It's very easy if you've got those sort of numbers in your head. And, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist here just to make good food selections throughout the day, particularly as far as protein. So, yeah, obviously, there's not much I can teach you. So, <laughs> but it's for the listeners, <laughs> for the listeners' benefit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, but but uh, going back to one of the things that that we also that I also mentioned was about meal frequency. Uh, mm-hmm. what, what's your take on that? Like, should you have uh, snacks throughout the day? I guess it depends on your right. training, perhaps. And and what about what sort of window you potentially should be eating? And do you have opinions on on that as well? If you should avoid eating late at night or or even in the morning. Okay. Well, we're still talking athletes here. So yep. there are two questions there. There's, there's the question of the athlete and there's the question of, uh, you know, for optimal health. And again, athletes are burning so many calories each day, especially if they're training more than once, that generally they don't really have to be worried about when they're eating, okay, as opposed to the unhealthy population who we can talk about a little bit in a second. So again, it, the question would, I'd throw it back to you. If an athlete is only doing one training session a day, or if someone is recreationally trained, like many of your listeners, and are perhaps training only three times a week, well, the need to get to carbohydrate or fat or protein or whatever it happens to be, you know, immediately after exercise in that three hours, isn't really an issue because they've got, you know, 24 to 36 hours to replenish their, their fuel needs. So for the recreational athlete, timing probably isn't that important. Now, once you get into the, you know, the eight to 10 hours a week and then over 15 hours, as I said to you earlier, it becomes more important. You have to pay more attention to it. You have to take more preparation, take more care. And again, as we've said before, you have to space out the meals. Again, there is no rule. What suits one athlete doesn't necessarily suit another. Um, This is anecdotal evidence, and I haven't got anything to back it up. But from my experience with athletes, and certainly from my wife's experience, females prefer smaller regular meals males can get away with you know eating two or three big meals throughout the day but again it depends on your personal choice it depends on your sport if you want an empty stomach if you're running for example cycling it doesn't really matter i can you know have a massive feed and get on the bike and equally i can do the same if i'm getting into the swimming pool but not not everyone can do that now an answer just very quickly to the second part there is a a huge uh, public media and also scientific push at the moment for something called time-restricted eating. And I'll just describe this very, very quickly for your listeners. The studies that have been done, and they're mostly out of America at the moment, so I'm not sure if the results apply across the world and to different cultures and for different sexes and for different populations, but generally in America, the average window of eating is around 12 to 14 hours a day. And what I mean by that is, for your listeners, think of the time that you had breakfast, think of the time which you had your last evening meal, and generally it may be from about, you know, seven o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock in the evening. So about a 13-hour window, perhaps. Now, what the dietitians are saying at the moment, and certainly some of the preliminary data, again, this isn't in athletes, I might add, it says that if you restrict your window of eating to perhaps eight to 10 hours a day without any attention to the energy that you're taking in or any attention 
to the composition of the food you're taking in, there are health benefits and in some cases weight loss. Now, the easiest way, again, for your listeners to think of that is just shift your breakfast to a couple of hours later. So your eating window is perhaps eight, nine, or at the most 10 hours. And the studies that are only just trickling out, but it's a very emerging area, suggest that at least for the the unhealthy and in inverted commas population, or perhaps people trying to lose weight, that this time restricting eating is a much more practical way of, of if you like dieting, than telling people to cut out X, Y, or Z, which is doomed to failure, as you know, some of your listeners may have known if they've tried dieting. So time restricted eating, you heard it first here. And I think we'll see a lot more in the next year or two on this. Uh, and it's certainly worth investigating. As far as athletes, I don't think they really need to bother because for the most part, especially in females, getting enough energy in is, is, is an issue in itself. So you don't really want to be trying to cut out energy. Yeah, I think that's a common message that that we've heard a lot of times on this podcast that for athletes, it's uh, a much bigger problem to get enough energy than to to not get enough. But for that, that said, for those listeners that are interested in time-restricted feeding, you did a great uh, podcast on uh, Sigma Nutrition Radio that, that we can link to in the in the episode. Yeah, I, yeah. I think yeah, that you excellent. talked a lot about that there. Excellent. Good. So... Uh, so, so the the thing that you mentioned as well about the the terms, the terminology, and, and misunderstood terms, you you talked about uh, mentioned high carb and low carb. Mm-hmm. Are there some other key terms that you want to uh, to de- explain for the listeners that are commonly used but perhaps yeah. misunderstood in nutrition? Yeah, I think I think that's a really good question that you've asked here. And again, the whole point of writing that article, which I'll I'll refer to your listeners to, it was in the um, International Journal of Sports Nutrition and Exercise Metabolism. And again, I'll send you this so you've got a link to it. One of the things that we became very aware of, and you do on a day-to-day basis when you're talking to athletes, is the fact that they get very confused with the terminology. And I guess one of the biggest at the moment, one of the biggest, you know, buzz things going around is this ketogenic diet, you know, for the population at large, and athletes are no different. You know, everyone wants a quick fix. Whether you're an athlete, you want the magic silver bullet that's going to make you perform better. Whether you're doing it for health or weight loss, you want something, you know, you want the quick fix. No one's actually prepared to put the hard work in and, you know, just burn more energy or eat less. Everyone wants a quick fix. So the ketogenic diet, when I talk to athletes, they say, oh, yeah, I'm on the low-carb ketogenic diet. So the first question I ask them is, you know, what did you have for breakfast? And they say, oh, well, you know, had, had yogurt and a little bit of juice and this, that, and the other. I said, well, you've probably had 50 grams of carbohydrate already. And the definition of a ketogenic diet is 5% of your total energy intake must only come from carbohydrates. And in practical terms, that's around 50 grams. So again, if you've had a can and a half of soft drink, you're, you're not on the ketogenic diet. And then you get people who say, well, I'm on the ketogenic diet, but I'm only eating rice. So it's like, well, (laughs) come on, you're not really on the ketogenic diet. So ketogenic diets have been massively popularized in the media. I would say to your listeners, it's impossibly hard to have less than 50 grams a day of carbohydrate unless you are seeing a dietitian or a sports nutritionist. It's almost impossible to construct your diet. So that would be one of my first ones, the fact that people get massively confused with what ketogenic diets are. And they're different from low carbohydrate diets. And I guess that leads into the second one. You know, people, as I said earlier, think a high carbohydrate diet is is eating as much carbohydrate as you can, carbohydrate loading, eating everything which, you know, inside has got carbohydrate on the label. That's not true at all. Again, depending on the athlete, depending on the training session, a high carbohydrate diet for some athletes, maybe six or seven grams per kilogram of body mass. That could be termed a high carbohydrate diet. A low carbohydrate diet, probably less than you know three grams per kilogram of body mass. I'll do a third one for you, and then we can either carry on or you can stop. You know, the train low. How low does your muscle glycogen have to be to train low and get some of the benefits that this what we call periodized nutrition, where an athlete deliberately starts a training session with lowered glycogen. Well, it's hard to put a number on that, but I'd say it's probably 50% of whatever your resting glycogen is. Um, The studies haven't really been done, but there's obviously a threshold of glycogen that you have to have in the muscle that's obligatory to do work in the first place. But secondly, you know, if you want to push that training adaptation, and the studies are quite clear now that you can, you probably need to have depleted your glycogen by around 50%. So 
that definition for train low is is a little bit vague at the moment. We use this term train low and, you know, the second section of the day is commenced with low glycogen, but we've not really put a figure on that. So th- they're just some of the other ones. And again, in, in the paper, which you'll have a link to, there are there are many there for your readers to go through and have a look. But uh, I just think they're the big three that come up in my mind. Yeah, I think I think that's very important to to cover those off. With, with the train low, are, you're saying, I guess, then that uh, people may say that they're training low when they really are not, because they're they're not at that low glycogen level that you really need to be at to truly be training low. What was that a, a correct understanding? That's an absolutely correct understanding, and you know. The the early studies, as you probably know, were done when athletes trained twice a day. And what they did is they did their normal session in the morning and then they deliberately withheld carbohydrate and did a second session, you know, some hours later. Now, in the lab studies that we've performed and other laboratories have performed, just by sheer luck, actually, we we hit upon sessions which depleted 50% of glycogen and we measured this by muscle biopsy. So we know that the subjects start with around 50% less glycogen. Now, I, I'm just sticking my head on the block here and saying I think 50% is probably right. Whether 40% is better or 60%, I'm not sure. But I think you have to have, you know, depleted your glycogen by a minimum of 50% to get that, if you like, increased training stimulus. Can we uh, can we quantify that uh, 50% into something like overall calories? And I guess this also leads into whether you should be doing a high-intensity session as that first session, because that will obviously burn more carbohydrate rather than just calories where most of it comes from fat. Uh, so, so how many calories would you typically need to burn? Because we know roughly, I guess, depending a bit on, on size, of course, how much glycogen you can you can store in your body. So, so it should be possible, yeah. I guess, to calculate a caloric number for how big that tra- first training session needs to be to get to 50%. Well, you can. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a very hard question to answer. I mean, because if you're starting the training session in the morning, obviously the preceding day's training load plus the nutrition, you know, plus your last meal has a massive influence. But if we go on the fact that, you know, if you're generally taking in around 400 grams, which is 1600 kilocalories of carbohydrate, you're probably going to be pretty high for that first session. Now, as you correctly pointed out, and again, we jump in a little bit of a head, but what we've found out, let's just go back to come forward. We've found that when athletes do train with lowered muscle glycogen, on average, their power outputs or speeds are reduced by about seven or eight percent. So that's the first point to to make here, you know, that the athlete without glycogen can't train as hard. But the trade-off there is that the hormonal and metabolic milieu and the adaptations in the muscle are greater than when you do all your sessions with high glycogen. So that that's, I guess, the first point. Now, when we did our first studies, uh, we did two sessions in the day. And obviously, as I've just said, the second session was somewhat compromised. We've now got a little bit smarter and we've got what we call uh, train high, sleep low. And if you want me to explain that, I, I can do that in a couple of minutes. So, Please do, yeah. yeah. When, okay. when you take, it, take it in the order that you feel is best. All right. So what we do now, and this is this is covered in the science paper, and there's a nice diagram there so your, your readers can link to that and see exactly what we mean by this so we give athletes their normal diet and we get them to train with high glycogen stores in the late afternoon or evening now because they've got high glycogen stores that training session is a high intensity one and is not compromised because glycogen is intact and you've got all the glycogen you need to do for the hard workout now what we do then is deliberately withhold carbohydrate foods, give them high protein and high fat, and put them to bed so they sleep low. In other words, they're trained with high glycogen, train high. We withhold carbohydrate. We get them to sleep in a low carbohydrate state. And then we bring them back the next morning, fasted for a training session. They've got the benefit the night before of doing a high intensity. And the next morning, it's just a long, easy ride or run for two hours, three hours. Their fat oxidation rates go through the wall. They're incredibly high. So by, I guess, sequence in the order of nutrition and training there, and this is the classic training nutrition interaction, we've got the best of both worlds. We've got the high intensity training session not being compromised. We've got hopefully the training adaptations happening in the night at a, at a better rate or a greater rate because 
the carbohydrate is being withheld. And then the next morning, they're burning as much fat as the muscle can possibly oxidize by having them train in a low carbohydrate status. So we've evolved, I guess, that scenario over the past five or six years, largely by trial and error, I might add, but largely through the input of athletes who have said that we don't want to compromise our training. How about training later in the day? So it was a case here of having a very good national ranked athlete in my lab who said, you know, this isn't, it, it, athletes aren't going to do this. If they see their power outputs on their uh, SRMs down by eight to 10%, they're just going to, you know, go back to what they did before. So that's something that has evolved with the input of athletes and coaches. And now we've got a very robust scientific model, which we do describe in the science paper, as I said, which we think is is probably a good compromise. Now, the final thing, and I know it's a long soundbite here, is train low should not be done every day of the week. When our first paper came out in Journal of Applied Physiology in 2008, I had a few angry uh, emails and phone calls from coaches who said, my athletes are you know, just in a heap. They're, they're performing worse than ever. And I said, well, why? What's going on? He said, we've done your train low. We've done it for three weeks now. I said, what do you mean? We did it twice a week or three times a week at the most. And there was a long silence on the telephone where I realized that the coach had been getting his athletes to train low chronically without even ever having high carbohydrate or quality sessions. So bear in mind, train low is not something you do every day. How do you, do you periodize that in the yearly plan as well that you do more of it in certain periods or can you do it one, two or three times per week throughout the year? What would be your opinion on that? Very good question. I think there are two scenarios. The first one I'll give you is, is I guess in the four to six weeks before, you know, an important race. I think it's very, very important then. I think it's good to get in some training sessions again, depending on your event, but certainly for, for endurance events and certainly for the, the longer events like a Y Ironman to get those, uh, train low sessions in in the morning uh, where you're burning maximal fat at a very, very high rate, I think is very, very important. Now, the other thing which actually, again, a coach raised to me, he said, um, and I was doing a seminar recently, he said, what about the athlete who's coming back from an injury? And I said, well, well, hold on, what do you mean? Do you want them to train low? He said, well, wouldn't you want them to train low occasionally so long as it didn't injure them further because you would accelerate their rate of progress back. In other words, accelerate their training adaptation. And I hadn't really thought of that before, honest. And I think that's a very good scenario. If you've got an athlete who can cycle, perhaps an injured runner who can cycle on the bike, there's no reason why they shouldn't be doing some of their sessions training low and getting back to peak fitness, you know, perhaps earlier than they could by accelerating that training adaptation process. So that's something I hadn't really thought of. But in answer to your you know, your first question, I don't use these all year round. I definitely don't. I don't use them pre-season. I think you need to build up a solid endurance base. We generally use these sessions in, as I said, the couple of months before a a major competition uh, and perhaps, you know, stopping them uh, probably two to three weeks out before you start a taper and some even more high quality work. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. That, that, That really does. And uh, I was going to come back to one other point that you made there somewhere along the way, but I really forgot what it was, but but you really did. That long <laughs> soundbite was perfect because my next follow-up would have been exactly that. Do, do you do them? How often do you do them in a week? Uh, but uh, no, yeah, I guess it was coming back all the way to the terms uh, that we described before and the ketogenic diet. And you mentioned there are 50 grams of, of carbohydrates. And, and then the argument that I see people make is that, uh, well, for athletes, it's more about are you actually producing ketones uh, versus the the carbohydrate intake so so what would you say to to that well look i mean we've done the studies i mean to get an athlete in a ketogenic state is is not difficult you just have to you know drop the carbohydrate to very very low levels as i said less than 50 grams a day and in the case of the studies that we've done 25 grams a day the, there are many trade-offs there. Yes, they're ketogenic. They uh, their breath smells horrible. They're irritable. They can't train as hard. Their sleep isn't as good. There are many, many things which you know people never actually mention until you're around the athletes who are actually doing a true ketogenic diet. And and by the way, when we do our studies at the Australian Institute of Sport, and this is again Louise Burke and her team there, they feed the athletes for a period of you know three to six weeks. They know everything that goes into their mouth. And I just want to reinforce the point that I made earlier that if you have an athlete sitting in front of you who thinks they're on a ketogenic diet, 
I'm willing to bet you quite a few euros that they're not. So that's, again, a very, very important point to bear home. Yes, there have been claims by various other people whose names I won't mention that, you know, the studies that have been done in the scientific literature haven't been done in long enough terms. They haven't been done in elite athletes. They haven't been done in events which are demanding of fat like ultra endurance events. And to that, I would say, well, go and look at the data which we've produced in as little as three weeks. We get, you know, the ketone levels and beta hydroxybutyrate levels just as high as any chronic diet. So it's hard to argue when our numbers are exactly the same as the others and we've got the same results in a shorter period of time. The other thing is it's almost impossible to get an athlete to do this for longer than three or four weeks because they feel so bad. So it's all right to say, you know, I want an athlete to do this for six months and you'd see different results and they go better in an ultra endurance competition. I'm not disputing that. They may or they may not, I might add. But on the other hand, you know, for that six months, they've got to live. They've got to be social. It's a terrible diet. Uh, you know, if you if you want to maintain a relationship or ever go out for dinner, it, it's just antisocial. And again, in my humble opinion, it works for a very, very small percentage of athletes who are doing ultra endurance events lasting, you know, several days or longer. It has no place in Olympic events or Olympic distance competitions. I'm sorry, it just doesn't. Yeah, and, and if you do ultra endurance events, then there's nobody around to to smell your breath or you don't need to talk to anybody <laughs> else either. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure you saw <laughs> Asker Jokendrup uh, gif that he posted on Twitter with uh, a li- two two people talking and, and one of them was... Uh, asking what what does it take to go on a ketogenic diet how long does it take to adapt and and the other one smartly responded that it it takes one week longer than the than the longest study that has been done <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> i have seen that and i know ask very well as i'm sure you do and uh, again if you ask ask jürgen drop ron moore and louise burke james morton all the people who've studied this for 10 or 15 years i think their answer would be the same unless you do an ultra endurance event and look again just to go back We started these studies of high fat in 2002, and we didn't go into these studies, as scientists should do, with with a paradigm thinking, you know, this isn't going to work. We wanted it to work. As a scientist, you go in with a hypothesis of no difference. It's of no consequence to us whether X diet or Y diet works. So if high fat diets had worked, we've done 10 or 15 studies now, we would be prescribing them for athletes. They don't work so that's why you do the science you give the message to the coaches and the athletes but again the message seems to get mixed somewhere up in the social media and you know i'll say to your listeners now that twitter isn't research twitter's people's opinion for the most part and that's not what i call peer-reviewed research so if you want to have an argument on twitter about it then that's great but remember it's not real science Yeah, that that's great, and uh, that that's, it's really great to to hear that long background that you, that you have done in in this work, and and also the I, I guess the not having the hypothesis from the start that it, this is something that's not working, but just the open mind uh, of seeing yeah. whether it works or or not. Um, but yeah. the original question, by the way, was more so re- regarding the 50 grams, whether it's uh, like for the argument that I see is that for endurance athletes, it can be 150 grams and it's still just as valid, but, but it's besides the point really, because yeah. I don't think that that's, uh, that's the point that we're trying to make either way. Uh, so let, let's talk about nutrition periodization instead, because you've done a lot of work, uh, work in that field as well. So can you tell us about that? Yeah, look again, uh, let's just take training before we even talk about nutritional periodization and, Your listeners, no matter what their sport, they don't do exactly the same workout every single day. And that's, you know, obvious. And they'll be there thinking, well, what's he talking about? Well, the same is true for nutrition. You don't eat the same nutrition every single day. You tailor your nutrition to your training. So there are days when you very much need less carbohydrate in an easy day than you do in a hard day. There are days where Even as an endurance athlete, you're doing resistance training, you need more protein. There are days when you may even have a a more high fat diet. So I guess the first point I want to make is that, you know, nutrition (coughs) is just like training. It's not one size fits all. And you certainly don't do the same every single day. So the concept the concept of periodization is exactly that, that you adjust your nutrition to the demands of the training and the outcomes of the training session that you want. And and it's really, you know, just a fancy term for saying that we eat 
differently to match the training load. It's as simple as that. It, it, okay, so so it's not really about the like yearly uh, changes. Like you want to do something for a week. It, it's more so about the daily and, and and how that changes based on the training. Is that is that simply it? I think so. Yes, but again, with the endurance and with predominantly focused on endurance here most of your questions have been focused on that so for the endurance athlete you know there won't be a massive variation from you know competitive season to to non-competitive maybe the carbohydrate intake is is increased as the competition gets nearer and the workouts get more intense and they're more carbohydrate dependent but on the whole the the athlete's diet is quite stable across the year but what i'm saying here is across a week or across different training sessions there may be you know deliberate attempts to withhold carbohydrate there may be deliberate attempts as we said before to go in the fasted state and to do a a long ride four five six hours or whatever it happens to be to enhance fat oxidation these are all subtle things but i'm saying over the general course of the year you know you're not suddenly go to to eat 80 percent of your energy from carbohydrate in the competitive season and you know down to 20 percent in the non-competitive that just doesn't work on average you know i don't like using percentages because that's a, a relative term and not an absolute but generally athletes will will consume you know 70 odd percent of their energy intake from carbohydrates throughout the year it may drop to 55 on some occasions it may go as high as 80 in others it's pretty stable but on a day-to-day basis with different training sessions and different objectives of those training sessions, the nutrition subtleties will change. Mm, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. But I think we need to add this term then to the commonly misunderstood because I certainly read articles on uh, various sites where uh, the authors refer to nutrition periodization as, for example, uh, in the preseason having a block of lower carbohydrate training where it's not really so much about the day-to-day but actually for three weeks they uh, reduce carbohydrate significantly and and then increase it later on but what you're saying is that that's not really what it's about which may- makes sense i'm not at all disputing that but but I, I guess that what i'm saying is that it's often misunderstood and uh, in, yeah. in in its use in that case well look again if you look at the data and look at the habitual dietary intakes of athletes and that's out there again my wife's reviewed the literature, it's remarkably stable. Just think of yourself as, a, as an athlete. You know, when you're not training 20 hours a week and you've perhaps got, you know, that off-season, three or four weeks, whatever it happens to be, where you're just doing three sessions a week or whatever, you're probably not changing the composition of your diet that much in terms of percentages. You're probably just lowering the energy intake. So, again, I would argue quite strongly that the, the athlete eats pretty similarly throughout the year. But uh, in those small micro cycles, whether it's pre-competition or pre-season or whatever it happens to be, yes, there will be subtle subtle changes, but they're not massive sledgehammer changes, not to the extent that I think people imagine. Well, speaking of that, those habitual eating patterns, you have a paper called Swifter, Higher, Stronger, What's on the Menu? And uh, in that paper, you, uh, as far as I understand it, uh, I only read the abstract, but you investigate what elite endurance athletes uh, typically eat and and how it differs yeah. culturally but but also what are the commonalities so can you talk a little bit about your findings in that paper sure yeah well i guess the first thing to to note and this was a real breakthrough is that that article that was an invited review which was published in science which is probably you know one of the highest impact journals in the world so for science to include something on sports nutrition and actually include it on the cover of the journal was a massive breakthrough so uh, you know, all credit to my wife because she did most of the heavy lifting and the writing on this. But that was really, uh, I think, quite a feather in the cap for sports nutrition. The fact that at last, serious nutritionists and scientists were taking sports nutrition properly. So I just wanted to preface it with that. So in the article, yeah, we discuss uh, some of the practices of, of elite athletes. And, you know, you sent me a couple of questions of whether these apply to the recreational athlete or the amateur athlete who's very, very good. I think they do. I think it's just in absolute terms that they differ. You know, you can have someone training eight hours a week. You can have, in your case, 20 hours a week. You know, you can have, dare I say it, 28 to 30 hours a week for some of the Hawaii Ironmen and such like. I don't think the overall, you know, energy for doing the activities, the composition changes. It's just that if you're burning more calories, you're eating more. As far as 
you know, as I said to you before, the more training you're doing, the more likely you have to be relying on some of the, you know, sports products that we very quickly discuss, the bars, the gels, the carbohydrate, electrolyte, fluid replacement drinks, and all these sort of things. So again, depends on the population you're talking about. But in that article, we make the point that uh, I guess it's, it's degrees of magnitude. For someone who's training three hours a week versus 30 hours a week, yeah, it's a tenfold increase. Something has to change, but the principles are probably pretty similar and, you know, a lot more similar than we'd perhaps like to think. Of course, the elite athlete is different. So um, physiologically, they're, they're massively different, but the fuels to combust their muscles, you know, whether you've got an elite muscle or a, a recreational trained muscle, you know, it still burns carbohydrate, it still burns fat, it still needs protein for resynthesis. It's just the degree which, you know, the training demands dictate the athlete in heavier training needs more. So we try to get that across in the in the article. And again, we discuss some of the things that we've talked about, um, the periodization, the ketogenic diet, some of the sports bars and gels. And again, one of the questions that you said is about the habitual intake of athletes there. If you look at the Kenyans who are a great model there, they're carbohydrate dependent. Their meals are very simple. They're lacking in a lot of the high saturated fats that we get in the Western diet. Uh, and again, you know, look at the Kenyans and, uh, and the East Africans. They're the best long distance runners. Are they great because of their diet? Probably not. They're great because of their tri- training. They're great because they're born at altitude. But certainly the diet plays a part and, you know, puts the icing on the cake. Yeah, and, and their body composition, they're not at a high body fat, fat percentage exactly. So so it's a good argument <laughs> against the fact that carbohydrates make you fat. And also, I don't think that they have type 2 diabetes. <laughs> Look, that you know, most of the Africans are, you know, 48 kilograms ringing wet. So, you know, a, a Westerner who's 70 kilos is never going to win a big city marathon these days. And 70 kilos, you know, as you know, isn't that heavy. But uh, generally, if you're over 50 kilos now, you, you know, you're not going to be at the front of the pack. And, you know, your listeners can look at the next start line of a marathon race and, you know, the skinnier guys are at the front and the, the, the people who are heavier, I dare say, it, are going to finish at the back. It's as simple as that, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so did you analyze food diaries in that uh, paper or in the research for that, for that paper? And did you find any, like, staple meals that seem to be common if we, for example, take a from a common Western diet, but from an elite athlete's perspective, like what would be some typical meals that they might consume for breakfast and or lunch and or dinner? Well, look, for the Africans, it's completely different. You know, they, they have a lot of mealy, mealy and maize and stuff, which probably looks fairly unpalatable to us. But for the general Western diet, you know, the, the staples are still the staples, the, the breads, the yogurts, the pastas, the potatoes. Uh, and it's funny, nutrition s- tends to go in waves. You know, at the moment, there's this big uh, push in some of the medical journals that, you know, eggs are bad for you and blah, blah, blah. And Stuart Phillips and others in the protein area have come out and said, well, you know, that's not necessarily true, for example. Um, there's a, There's been a swing against, you know, dairy. The, uh, things come and go. But the endearing and the enduring feature is, you know, carbohydrates are carbohydrates. And you know, for the most part, no matter how you get them in, the muscle sees them the same. They'll resynthesize them to glycogen. Uh, and again, the, on a meal-to-meal basis, it's very hard to give you that information because it depends where you are. If you're in Europe, you're eating differently to South America, you're eating differently to North America. But again, most of your listeners will know what the good high-quality carbohydrates are. They'll know to stay away from the saturated fats. They'll know that, you know, protein in both animal form and vegetable form is, is very good. Uh, I think I think most people have got a pretty good idea of what they should be eating. It's just whether whether they stick to that is the is the point. Yeah, yeah. But but so it's okay to eat oatmeal. We don't have to go and get some uh, Kenyan carbohydrate sources or buckwheat no. or quinoa or whatever the uh, superfood no. carbohydrate source is these days. No, look, I mean, again, it's availability. That's what they eat in East Africa. It's not what we eat in Australia. It's not what, you know, people eat in Europe. You you eat what's practically there, what's available, what's, you know. Another way of looking at this, of course, and I forget which paper this is in, but, you know, someone's done the comparison of various foods and how many grams of either carbohydrate or protein you get per per dollar spent or per euro spent. And you, you can look at it that way if you like because, you know, all athletes aren't necessarily rich and can afford high quality protein sources. But no, I think it's what's available in the country, local customs dictate, 
uh, you know, the French eat differently to us. Maybe the Portuguese eat differently. <laughs> I'm not sure, but uh, it, it's practicalities. Uh, it's it's the basics again. I think we tend to get a little bit too fancy. I mean, the muscle sees glucose; it resynthesizes glycogen. It's not really that worried where it comes from. Okay, no, that's a really good message. Really good message to uh, to take home. And uh, a few more things. Well, for, I'll jump to the to one of the questions that is a bit down the list because I really want to ask this question. Make sure that we get that in. And that is, what are the most common mistakes that you think endurance athletes make? in their nutrition in their nutrition well i thought you were going to stop the question at you know what are the common mistakes endurance athletes make it might be the nutrition exercise interplay like not fueling but but somehow related okay. to nutrition no again and I, I don't want to stereotype this but you did hit on it early and we we vaguely discussed it i think for someone who's training 20 plus hours a week particularly females i, I think the concept of taking just enough energy forget forget what food type it is just enough energy in to to meet the fuel demands and we see you know a whole myriad of of injuries you know the stress factors the bone injuries the the compromised immune system which is a big thing when you have what we call low energy availability which is basically just a term which means you're not taking in enough food to match the the demands of daily living plus training so i i think that's one that i'd i'd put you know quite quite highly up there again i'm not saying it's just specific to females because we see it in male cyclists as well but the the energy availability concept uh, is an interesting one and i think that's a mistake that that people make um as far as other things you know i, I think a common mistake and i'm jumping into competition here is that people often try nutritional strategies you know in a race and they have not trialed them out in a in a training situation and you know I can give you examples of even elite athletes who have done this. That's a big no-no. So as far as nutrition, try everything in training before you do it in racing. It's, that sounds so simple. It's not funny, but you would be absolutely amazed at how many athletes I've spoken to who say, oh, yeah, I tried this. You know, I had really bad GI disturbances. I said, well, you know, did you have those in training? I said, well, no, we only do this during competition. So rule number one, if you haven't done it in training, do not do it in competition. Um, what's another one, I guess? I mean, athletes are no different to the general population. And I think, I think they follow the same trends in the social media. And I, I guess the point I want to make there is when athletes deliberately avoid certain foods, you know, we don't eat this or we don't eat that. That always, to me, is a little bit of a red flag. And uh, it's a long jump here, but, you know, it's, it's a little bit of disordered eating there. And I start to get a little bit worried when athletes say, oh, I never eat this, or I've been told never to eat that. And I think, really, you know, what scientific basis is there for that? And I generally get a little concerned because anytime you abstain from something, um, the bottom line is extremes are dangerous. So too much of something is bad for you, but not enough of something is equally as bad for you. So I guess they're the three, three things that spring to mind immediately. Mm. And related again to that uh, diets and and media and uh, and hype around cer certain diets and and ways of eating restricting certain foods, uh, there are a few things that that seem to pop up in terms of arguments for various diets. And one of these is inflammation and recovery. We we hear a lot of times from from the low carb carb camp that carbohydrates cause inflammation and mm. and on a low carb diet you improve recovery and from a scientific point of view uh, how, is this correct how does this stack up with <laughs> with what you know and have seen it doesn't stack up at all <laughs> I mean, no 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 look i mean there are studies done uh, years ago uh, by a colleague dr mark fabrio and again i can send you the links to these that show that one of the uh, inflammatory cytokines il6 uh, is massively elevated in the normal state but if you drink carbohydrate during exercise it suppresses that so you know it's exactly the opposite to what the media are saying you know inflammation to some degree is is an important uh, part of the adaptive training process but too it's like i've just said too much of anything is bad too much inflammation is a is a prerequisite for some metabolic diseases but again to get a training stimulus you have to have some muscle damage occasionally you have to have a little bit of inflammation so i think that's been massively massively overplayed and you know the carbohydrate again seems to be the culprit here when quite quite clearly the evidence is totally to the contrary 
Yeah, and, and I guess we should point out that, again, you said that things come and go. And I guess 30 years ago, it was FAT that, that was the uh, the big culprit. And uh, and now things are turning to the extreme on, on the other end. So uh, yes. the, the, the other thing that I wanted to ask about was insulin and, and blood glucose response, which I assume is another thing that has been overplayed because otherwise you wouldn't be recommending to include a good amount of carbohydrate in the diet but that's another argument that you hear that uh, when you eat carbohydrate you you get an insulin response and you will become insulin resistant and, and you will get a high blood glucose response and that is quote unquote bad for you so so can you get into the details right. a bit more about that let me give you physiology 101 there are two ways that you can take insulin into the skeletal muscle and let's just go back one step when you ingest a meal and it's usually a mixed meal. Let's get this quite straight because the studies obviously only sometimes look at carbohydrate meals. Well, you don't sit down to just carbohydrate. You sit down to a meal which has carbohydrate, fat, protein, and other you know, micronutrients in there. The first thing that happens is you get a glucose response. As you correctly pointed out, your glucose goes up and with it, the pancreas secretes this hormone, insulin, which then takes that glucose into insulin-sensitive tissues. Now, Skeletal muscle accounts for 70 to 80% of that glucose disposal. Number one, athletes are highly insulin sensitive, which means that their muscle literally sees insulin and soak, uh, sorry, sees glucose and soaks it up like a sponge. Now, there are two ways of disposing of, of glucose after a meal. Obviously, the hormone kicks in, insulin, but the other way is contraction. So you can actually contract a muscle and you will have an increased rate of glucose uptake and again the athlete is almost in a continual state of contraction they've either just trained or just going to train so in the case of an athlete and arguing that the athlete shouldn't be taken in carbohydrate because it will make them insulin resistant and prone to diabetes i can't think of anything more ridiculous now on the other hand if you're saying to me should a type 2 diabetic have a massive carbohydrate meal, you know, before they go out and exercise or after? Of course, the answer is no. Why? Because their transport system to transport glucose into their muscle is impaired. It's broken. It doesn't work as well. So it's horses for courses, as we say in English. The athlete is an insulin sensitive animal who is absolutely able to take in carbohydrate and tolerate it. On the other hand, diseased populations like the type 2 diabetic and a person who is insulin resistant does not have the machinery to take insulin into the tissues as efficiently as the athlete. So again, question is generic, but it applies and the answer is different for different populations. Okay, great. And finally, uh, the final argument that we see is often body composition that uh, it's easier to lose body fat if you're on a low carb low carb diet and uh, what's uh, what does the evidence say about that firstly diets per se and let's define the term what do we mean by diet because diet really means your food mix you're talking about energy restricted diets in other words people eating less than their energy output that's what you really mean by a diet okay now if you take away carbohydrates in the short term, in the first week, maybe up to 20 odd days, the studies show, you will lose weight on the scale. That is weight. That is not body composition. The reason you lose that is that when you withhold carbohydrate, when carbohydrate is stored in the muscle and the liver, it stores with it, depending on which paper you read, two to three grams of water. No carbohydrate, no water. All right. Very simple way, easy way. You can do it on yourself as a trial. Withhold carbohydrate tomorrow. You'll feel pretty crappy training, but you'll probably get on the scale the next morning a kilo lighter or at least 500 to 600 grams. So that's the first point there. The second point is, and I really want to stress this point importantly, the general population is too hung up with weight. Body composition is the best predictor of your health outcomes. In other words, the ratio of your muscle mass to your fat mass. And that's more important. We don't even have scales in the house. We have scales in the lab just to measure subject's weight in order that we've got that before they do a VO2 max test. What we do with subjects, whether they be athletic or 
so-called unhealthy, is we DEXA scan them for their body composition. So again, answer your question, you will lose weight as denoted by the scale weight in the short term. Most energy restricted diets, unfortunately, in the long term, and I'm talking six months, 12 months, 18 months follow up, are ridiculously unsuccessful, which is why, as I said before, if this time restricted feeding or time restricted eating can be shown to be a practical way of people to lose weight and hopefully fat mass without paying massive attention to you know, restricting energy or changing the composition of fat and carbohydrate, I think we're onto a winner there. Yeah, that, that makes makes perfect sense. And if I'm not mistaken, there are some meta analysis that have uh, compared low carb or c- compared different diets and found that if you control for overall energy intake and, and protein intake, then it does, doesn't matter at all what your fat and carb intake is in terms of, of body composition changes. It could be uh, one high in one and low in the other or vice versa as long as you control for that overall energy intake and protein intake then then it's all the same is that uh, is that correct you're absolutely correct on that and i guess the other thing that i will you know thrash out again is that most of the studies that are in the in the medical literature only measure the weight of the subject and they pay very very little attention to the um to the actual body composition and what i'm saying is you know the scales measure mass they measure how much of you is there that that's as simple as it gets it's a basic measure but it's not an accurate measure and as you said earlier you know body composition uh, the reason the kenyans are good is because they have a very very high muscle mass and a very low fat mass and again that is the bottom line for both athletic performance and health whether you're you or i training every day whether it's our parents who are trying to maintain their muscle mass everyone wants to have the highest muscle mass they can for their event with the lowest fat mass. And of course, the only exception I can think of that is, you know, sumo wrestling, but most of us aren't sumo wrestlers. So that that holds across the board. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Is there anything else you want to add before we go into the rapid fire questions? Now, I like your rapid fire questions. I'll have to be, you know, rapid fire with the answers for some of these, but um, <laughs> yeah. go, go ahead. We'll, we'll keep these to 15 seconds, like you said. We'll just give you a quick soundbite. All right. So first one, what's your favorite book, blog, or resource related to your field of expertise? (laughs) And that's the hardest one. So I'm drawing a blank on that. Look, I do follow Twitter quite religiously. And I follow, you know, the Stu Phillips, Luke Van Loons, Louise Burks of this world. So I find some of the Twitter discussion very, very useful. On the other hand, I find some of it very, very frustrating. So again, like I said to your listeners earlier, uh, Twitter is not science, but it's a good forum sometimes for exchanging, you know, controversial ideas. It has come up before quite a few times, Twitter, but it all comes down to you need to know who to follow on Twitter. I think. Correct. <laughs> Correct, yes. What's a personal habit that's helped you achieve success? Uh, okay, I probably in an average year miss about seven or eight days of training, and that's usually when I'm on the road or uh, I'm traveling in, a, in an airplane at 33,000 feet. So I think the discipline of uh, being an athlete or an ex-competitive athlete and and always making that time in the day because some of my best thoughts for studies have come when I'm on the bike or actually swimming in the pool and I've got out and I've written the idea down and, you know, maybe nine times out of 10, it hasn't been a a brilliant brainwave that I thought it's been, but certainly regular exercise every day keeps me sane, number one, keeps me fit, number two, but also has been really good for sort of generating some of the ideas. I get my best thinking sometimes at the end of a workout. Well, first, congratulations for being a fantastic role model to all of us. And, and second, I love that term, making time. It, it's not so much about having time as, as making time. Of course and, it is, yeah. And, and finally, what do you wish you had known or done differently at some point in your career? Oh, I wish I'd have known when I was a competitive athlete and a very good one in New Zealand as a junior running very fast 400 meters that I didn't need to do long, slow runs and run 50 or 60 miles a week. I would have cross-trained much more. I would not have done slow miles. I would have not got as injured as much. And, you know, who knows? I would have been a lot better. But, of course, as we get older, we always get faster and better, don't we? <laughs> so so you, you were on the, on the Lydiard approach then? Well, I got influenced by a Lydiard-type coach, but I was a 400 and 800-meter runner, and I started doing a lot of, I won't call it long, slow distance, but just unnecessary miles. And I just think it killed all the fast twitch fibers I ever had. So if I could have my time again, I would probably do a little bit more cross training. I would certainly do a lot more resistance training 
for muscle mass because I didn't even touch that until I was, you know, in my early 20s. And I'd probably train less. I'd actually train less. I think I could compete now. I have a 15-year-old son who's a national level swimmer, and it's taken us a while, the last three or four years, to figure out that, you know, he doesn't need to swim, you know, 4Ks a session because he swims, you know, events which take two minutes. So I think generally people are overtrained. So rest judiciously. When I say I exercise every day, I'm a light you. I'm like a triathlete. I can rest my legs by swimming. So I'm not hammering my body every single day or the same muscle mass. So I think I would train a little bit less uh, and probably have performed a lot better. <laughs> mm. Okay. Yeah. So finally, where can people follow you and uh, find out find out what you have got going on and, and new papers and, and such that you're publishing? Okay, good question. So uh, I am on Twitter and I generally, um, I'm not a massive Twitterer, as it were, if that's the correct verb. Um, I, I generally put new papers on that the lab publishes uh, as they come out, uh, generally the ones that are freely available. And again, most of the ones that we've discussed in this um, podcast are freely available. And so I'll be able to send you those, including uh, the science one, which is a, is a free download. Um, and again, you know, if they're really, really, really interested, there's a there's the PubMed site where you can look up anyone in the world or just stick in keywords ketogenic diet athletes and you know it'll it'll spew out 500 to 5000 papers so they're the main views uh, i guess where i put my perspectives across twitter and on pubmed so you can see what we're actually publishing but there are a lot of good people and, and, there and i'll add i'll add researchgate as well because i, yeah, I know you're there because yeah. i got you out there no research gate is good my secretary does that for me i don't have time to do that but again your point was very valid earlier um You've got to know who to follow, and I'm not going to advocate who not to follow, but I've mentioned a few names. And again, the people who are publishing in the field, who are at the coalface doing the work with the athletes, they're the ones to follow, not people who are not doing research but have opinions on Twitter and you know haven't really studied an elite athlete in their lives. I get very, um, I'm very disappointed when these people have huge followings with little scientific background. So that's my uh, i guess that's my gripe on that <laughs> okay thank thank you so much john it, this has been super useful this will be a very well received episode i'm sure L thank you for talking and uh, you know if you're doing 20 hours of training a week you're obviously eating well and uh, yeah i'll have to follow you in races to see how you go thanks yeah i'll go and have lunch now <laughs> okay make sure you've got some protein in there yeah yeah <laughs> all right take care nice to chat take care bye I really hope that you enjoyed that interview as much as I enjoyed talking to, to John. I think that if you're a regular listener and you, you've been following the podcast for a long time and listened to most of the episodes, then you will agree with me when, when I say that this episode was for endurance sports nutrition, what, for example, uh, the episode with uh, Joel Filial would be for just triathlon training in general, the, the coaching and training aspect. There was just so much great advice from somebody who really knows his stuff and, and actually has evidence to, to back it up, to back up what he's saying. And that's nutrition is a minefield when it comes to this. So, so I think it's important to really, really pay attention to who you are following on social media and actually listening to and being extremely critical with how you consume information in uh, about nutrition because there is so much misinformation going on so i am super happy that uh, that john agreed to come on the show because he's one of the one of the busiest people in the industry because he's one of the most well-known and and most sought after experts so uh, so it's really i express gr the greatest gratitude to john for that and and hope that you uh, you agree with uh, with me that it was uh, worth his time that he has made a big impact on on all of us with with this interview so uh, go to that show.com to get uh, all of the links to the to the research papers that we talked about and uh, and of course to just see the the recap of this entire episode and you can also on the scientific com website find all related episodes all nutrition episodes that we've done here by going to the menu bar to more popular topics and nutrition and there you'll find all of those episodes and fortunately i can say that almost every single one of them are definitely aligned with what we talked about today and uh, i can recommend listening to those as well that's one of the advantages i guess of 
of being very selective with the guests that I bring on, that there are not too many that I would discourage you in hindsight from listening to but but there is a notable exception and without naming names i will say that it's episode uh, number 44 so uh, that one i would avoid but but all the other ones should should be good to go in the next episode except for first this q a that's a q a of course but next monday uh, i have a big two-part interview so that will be part one of that two-part interview where I interview Menachem Brody, who is one of the best endurance sports strength coaches in the world. So we'll get into into the weeds there with strength training, which which has been a while. So I think it's really good that we bring that topic up to the forefront again, because strength training is an important part of triathlon training. So look forward to that. Stay subscribed, of course, so that you don't miss it. Finally, a house cleaning item. You heard me a month or so ago, I guess, announced that I'm looking for somebody to help me with customer support on Scientific Triathlon. And uh, yeah, I can announce now that I filled that position with uh, a coach uh, from Belgium. His name is uh, David Duch, and he's a full-time coach and uh, joins the ranks here to help out with, first and foremost, uh, questions about training plans. So people that buy training plans from Scientific Triathlon, uh, can get help by reaching out to him but also if you have questions for the podcast the best way to get them past the queue or like to towards the front of the queue at least is to send them to him directly because they have a much greater chance of making the podcast list as my inbox is sort of overflowing and i'm a bit uh, dr- drowning in my email so to say which is why i'm so grateful to have somebody like david who can help me out uh, david is a very knowledgeable coach has been coaching for for a long time and has a lot of experience has worked with great coaches as an athlete himself uh, his email is support at scientific com. so take a mental note of that if you're a training plan customer then any questions you have about training plans or if you are considering buying a training plan you will get better and faster responses from david than from myself so send your emails to him you can put me in the cc if you like that's totally fine the same thing if you have general questions not related to a training plan but something that you want answered on the on the podcast then send those questions to to him as well and we'll get that into the into the q a backlog and and get your question answered on the on an upcoming episode so welcome officially david to the team it's really great to have you and again his email is support at scientific triathlon.com finally big thanks to roca that you can find on roca.com but until the 26th of may they are running a giveaway on roca.com forward slash tts as in that triathlon show so that's the url i wanted to go to and uh, just enter your email to enter the giveaway where you can win a lot of great prizes, including that Ironman race entry and the Roka Maverick X wetsuit, which is the flagship wetsuit model. And thanks to Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Take their free online sweat test to get your individualized hydration strategy and use the promo code that Triathlon Show, all one word, all caps, to get your first box for free. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.